Good afternoon. Welcome to Match Day. Uh, this is Vince. Um, my name is Vince. We have Ian. And with us again, we have Rob Cummings from Missouri S&T. And Rob, thank you very much for being on again and helping. Thank you for having me. And Coach Barker, do we got you? Yeah, you got me. Awesome. So uh, this, this basically, this little presentation will be uh, kind of just giving some ideas. That's all they are ideas for return to play as from what I'm hearing, more States are opening up more, more clubs are having the opportunity to play and, and, and get kids back on the field a little bit, but with conditions, um, for example, the high school association here in Indiana, they sent the, the, the Indiana high school state athletic association sent out like a 38 page document right for guidelines and this is this is also for class too but it was unbelievable you know you got to wipe down the balls you got to do all that so and we have to submit um really detailed plans on how we're going to keep these kids uh physically distanced and, and in a safe way so i'm sure a lot of you are in the same boat but uh we can start here in, in, in indiana for the high school kids i guess now it's July 6th, we can actually kind of work with the kids a little bit. Um, but, you know, their their parameters, right? Small groups, you know, no contact, you know, and like, for example, football is no contact at all right now, you know, when they go back. So a lot of parameters, a lot of conditions, but we thought we'd share just a few ideas. And I'm sure a lot of you on the other end have, you know, great ideas, but uh, Yes, Coach Mark. Before we start, Rob, what at the NCAA Division II level, have you been told what you are and are not allowed to do by the NCAA and or by your university? So right now we're we're in the phase of voluntary because we're in the summertime. So now we're talking about voluntary workouts. And what they're trying to implement will, will be people will have to get their temperatures um, gauged every time before they train. And number two, there will be no equipment um, allowed for the first at least two weeks to kind of see how that goes and will progress. So there's no gear. They can't use a soccer ball. Everything would just be fitness and, and using that as we move forward. And then we'll slowly progress because they even talked about preseason on our end through our athletic trainers of having three weeks before we could even use equipment or, you know, any of that type of stuff. So, yeah, we're all kind of navigating, but there, nothing's been done. Um, you know, for sure yet as we navigate. So we're going to need to get sports and sport performance conditioning experts on, mm -hmm. on how you bring a soccer player back for competitive action without using the ball. Yeah. Because no, it's you're not going to be go for a 15 mile run anymore, right? It's going to be a very specific training regimen if you subtract the soccer ball. No, you're right. And that's, yeah. that's where I'm going to think about it. even said I had to rethink I can't do the same work that I would do in the past. It just wouldn't make sense in this time. Yeah. So all the activities I have put together um, are with the ball. But just because I'm thinking, you know, 10-year-olds to 16-year-olds to high school. you know. So the activities I'm about ready to show, I think a, a multiple of age groups can use. And by the way, th these are just a few. So let's go ahead and just start. And then um, – Start the presentation. If anybody wants on the other end, if anybody wants this deck, uh, you know, feel free to email me and I'm more than happy to share. But obviously these are the CDC recommendations. You know, uh, we're supposed to, you know, uh, frequently, you know, uh, wipe down the balls, obviously wash hands, have hand sanitizers ready. That was one of the things that was on the IHSAA, Indiana High School Athletic Association thing where coaches have to have a supply of sanitizers and, wipes and that's going to be a challenge right because well you know there there's you know you can't it's tough to find them um you got to wear face you know uh, cloth um six feet away cover your mouth and stay home if you're sick and then we haven't i didn't see anything rob about you know uh taking their temperatures and all that so it, that's going to be interesting but um these are some basic guidelines again the aspen institute as a wonderful website if you go to aspen institute um return to play if you google that you'll come you'll see theirs um and also the english fa have come out with a really nice little uh graphic 
that show us some wonderful little suggestions. So I'll just share some activities. Um, and again, uh, coach, uh, coaches, uh, Cummings and, and Barker, please chime in. So this is just a real simple little passing game. Again, they're six feet apart, uh, minimum, but they're just passing back and forth, just going back and forth. And, um, you know, when the coach says stop, whoever has the last touch, the other person gets the point, right? So it's just coach Barker and I one touch, boom, 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 boom. And Rob says, stop. If I have, if I touched it last coach Barker gets the point. So it's a real simple little game. Um, you can do right foot only, left foot only, mandatory two touch. After they pass, maybe they got to whatever, move sideways or spin around or do a push up and get back. I mean, there's lots of little variations you can do. And then on the bottom here, it's groups of four. Uh, again, so they're just competing against each other, but they are um, crisscrossing with each other, right? So now it's a little bit more difficult. Now you add a little bit uh, more uh, pressure. So Yeah, um, I think um, just a couple of things, Vince. So I definitely think this works for little guys. I think college players, once they're allowed to use the ball, could do this. <laughs> add, add time in so it becomes a race. I think you're probably going to get there because we did this with Long Island just the other day. Make yep. it time so there's competition and challenge. I think yeah. we all know if you drop two cones down between the kids and they've got to play it through the cones, the technical level improves. Um, I quite like pass and follow. So assuming that you're measuring the distances, there's movement in here. Um, and at least the player who's receiving it has got to get it out from under and knocked on before the kid gets there now because of social or physical distancing rules. But I think you can make these more than just kick it backwards and forwards. They're definitely... Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's definitely ways to gamify them. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it can even be like a ball that, that starts like in the air, right? So it's like a bounce in between and it's in the air. You know, it could be done like that. Um, you know, and with that said, as much as you can, I, my recommendation is like keep the ball on the ground as much as you can and everything is brought in with their feet instead of their hands because the more they use their hands, the more you have to wipe down the balls. So – like even in, if you if you do play a game, um, you should use kick-ins instead of throw-ins, for example. Um, but uh, okay, I'll move on. So speaking of pass, this is uh, something that I got from Bobby Clark many, many, many years ago, um, and it's a real simple little activity. Now you can do it where they compete with each other and against other pairs, or they can be competing against each other. So the way it works, it's real simple. Uh, you got uh, three triangles, six feet apart, and they pass the ball, and then whoever receives it has one touch to get it around a cone and then back through. But that player now has to receive it, and then they can go either way, right? They can go this way or they can go back this way, So, and that would force this player to move. So it's always you receive it, take a touch around a cone, back through, play for time, play for you know and, and if they if they don't get it back through then it's a point for the other player um or you, they can see how many times in 60 seconds you can do it without hitting any cones right so and you got two touches one to take it around one to pass through so. um and then another sort of variation one player positions on this cone i'm the pink arrow this afternoon <laughs> and this is the player working so the ball gets played, he or she would knock that ball back right-footed. Then yeah. they move across the grid, yeah. the ball gets played, they knock it back left-footed. So you can do all the different technical challenges, air service control, but this player is going backwards and forwards. So he or she's getting a little anaerobic workout and yeah. they're working the right side and the left side of their body. This kid is resting, but just serving. That gives you a significant amount of uh, physical distancing but a ton of technical challenge against time and against space. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is another version of it, but um, it's more of a relay race. So you got two teams and I'll just demonstrate. So it's basically pass and follow. So they pass and then they follow pass. And then the third person dribbles to there and then they just repeat it again. So you can play for time or you can play to win. 
uh, the person that starts the game gets back to their original spot, the game's over, right? So uh, the race is over. So you can go right, you can go left, you can throw in different patterns in there too if you want. There's lots of little different patterns, but it, it's a relay race. So again, just kind of incorporating some fitness and some technical and tactical. But you're right, Coach Parker, as much as you can, make it a challenge, make it a competition, uh, throw on this. Um, so Amin has a question I'm trying to see here. Uh, what do you do? What do you think help coaches and players avoid holding the ball? Yeah. What do you think about that, guys? Um, as much as you can put it on the floor and keep it on the floor, I just think it's better. I mean, yeah. as much as we, at this point, that way you don't, it's just less stress, I think, right now with everybody self conscious, everything. If you can keep it to where you're just living it to your feet, not get it into play and all that, it's just yeah. better. Yeah, I think, um, I think I, I'm with Rob there. I mean, um, if you've got the right age kids, so perhaps if Rob was working kind of like a technical shuffle with the college kids, we'd have them serve from their hands for air control or heading or something because it's just you guarantee the service. You can't do that, but the college kids could now work on lifting the ball with their toe. They can do that, and it just adds a technical challenge. The we the wee kids, though, we sometimes use the hands because it's the only way to, to give the service. We're just going to have to stop doing that activity. So I think, I think I'd increase the technical challenge for the right age, and then I just would abandon the technical – I would abandon – the uh, the activity at the younger ages yeah and or i, I go think ahead. just real quick the only other option would be if you know and you have a plan what you're going to do i guess the other thing would be having the surgical gloves I mean, if you know this is what you have planned for training another thing would be kind of safe is having those gloves available for you if you as a coach is the one serving it for the little ones in the yeah. air now very good yeah all right so the next one i just called around the world um again three players but now you make a square uh so it's it's actually um it's no different from the old 3v1 game you know and you can always put a defender in the middle if you wanted to i guess but the idea is that it's they pass so uh, let me get my arrow sorry about that so they pass so they pass one way but they're going to move another way right so after this player for example passes she's going to move over here to receive it after this player passes she's going to move this way so it's pass and they run opposite now so it's a little different but again you can have it as a relay race when they get back to the original spot it's over um you can make all sorts of rules you know like they have to take it outside the cone you know um they have to receive it with the you know the foot across their body or there's just different little patterns you can throw in there. Um, for example, let me see if I can clear it. So it could be uh, right pass, and then maybe they go here, and now it's more of a they got to figure out that little pattern, right? So there's different patterns you can throw in there for them. Um, guys, anything? Again, simple, right? Very simple. Just again, but it's more of a challenge, more of a competition. Anything to get them going, you can go different directions. So it's pretty simple. Yeah, well, if I may, Vince, just real quick. So it makes me smile because uh, for those of you, I mean, this might be you working with the, the little guys. This activity, you have to have four kids to do it if you're going to pass and move. Yeah. But because you can't have two kids at the same spot, you have to incorporate the dribble so you have everybody back at each station. Yeah. I love these ideas that Vince is showing, but you've got to practice them. Yeah. to make sure that one you can complete the rotation and yeah. two that you don't end up with two kids at the same space so <laughs> they're good but don't just go out cold make sure you've moved some some uh, sugar packets around beforehand <laughs> <laughs> I'm to repel like magnets um if they know what that means so this is another one uh you got two teams again there's they're minimum six feet apart um so you got one team that's going on the outside of the square and you got one team that's going – let me see if I can change my color. Um, you got one team that's going kind of here at a diamond, right? So – and then it's just a relay race, or you can – it's for time. So when it gets back to the original person, that's one. When it gets back again, that's two. And you can switch them. You can uh, have the players that were on the outside come inside. 
Um, and you, you might have to make a rule that you this player here can the players cannot interfere with the team in white, right? So they can't interfere with that pass. Or you can say they can. Yes, they get, you know, they just can't um, go and pressure them. So there's lots of little twists you can put in there. So Amin's got another comment. It's good. Vince, do you have your foosball activity in here, the three zones? No. Okay, I, so maybe you want to show Amin or just quickly deal yeah. with the foo the foosball concept of defending. Yep, yep, yep. I'll show him that um, when we get there. All right, so, yeah, I need – it's on a different – I'll find it, though. It's a different document. Um, So horseshoes is, uh, again, another game I got from Coach Clark. It's a, it's a favorite. So basically they're in teams or they're competing. Um, usually it's fun. It's more fun when they compete. So – Basically, they get two cones. There's a ball. There's ideally they're supposed to chip it in the air. So this player would chip it, and this player is one touch to get the ball as close to this cone as they can. And then when they when they're done, they chip it here, and then this player is one touch to get it uh, as close to the cone as they can. Now, for younger kids. Just have them pass the ball, and I tell them they can't stop it. They got to touch it, right? They have to touch it and get, get as close to that cone as they can, right? So then – and they love the game. They love horseshoes. Um, and Rob, I know you you probably played it, right, quite a, quite a bit of times. With you. It's a great recovery yeah, game. Yeah, I usually let them play first, and I do scouting because I always chime in, but I get an idea which player I want to pick up. It's my partner because as a, as a coach, it doesn't mean I'm not a competitor, so I want to get an idea. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's a fun little game. Um, They love it. Yep. And, you know, unfortunately, that the best way to play it is in fours. Yeah. You know, what, I guess you could do it in fours. You could put a cone here. You could put a cone here, right? And these two are now with each other. Um, and then you got, so you could bring the cones a little bit together and they can compete in force. So, well, you could probably uh, do this too. If you just have where the one involved just steps away, like normally around yeah. the six feet, get them off to the side. So the only one involves the one hitting the ball and settling yeah. it however you want. And then they step away while the other two come in. Yeah. Good idea. Yep. Yep. Good. Um, this one, I, I, I'm going to try with the high school kids, but basically it's, it's, they're just passing back and forth, trying to get as many passes as they can. But these players can pass and hit a ball, right? And there's a distance. Now, the twist is if they pass and this player here isn't looking, then that ball is going to go over here, so go over like here. So they're going to be chasing it. So they got to kind of talk. It's it's It can be confusing. I wouldn't recommend it for 9- and 10-year-olds. But it's just a – but you notice here they're, they're in pairs. Uh, so they can just switch on and off. So the, I just got ball tag. Uh, oldie, buddy, goodie, soccer, tennis. But you can see here the the grids are more defined, right? So they're just – they have to stay in their space. Um, but soccer, tennis rules, however you want to play it, um, there's lots of ways you can play it for points and stuff like that. Um, and I'm going rather quick. Four square. It's an old school playground game that I used to hate because I used to get beat all the time. But you have a royalty box. Someone starts and you can play with the ball. Maybe they got to get a bounce, right? But the ball's always got to be in the air. And if this player serves it and this player here cannot return it, well, then everybody rotates clockwise. Everybody goes clockwise. So this player then moves in. But uh, anyway, there, there's lots of little uh, variations on four square as well. Tic-tac-toe, I showed this the other night. The only uh, unintended consequence is like these markers, and I'll explain how they're, they're used. But you can maybe use something else. But you just make a tic-tac-toe board with cones, uh, chip the ball in the air. They got It's like horseshoes. They got one touch to keep it in the that square, right? So they got one touch to keep it in this whole square. 
So there, if the ball goes out, they don't get to mark it. But if they do, then they just grab a marker and they just put it in that square. Then the other pair goes. And if they get tic-tac-toe, they win. Or if they get a cat, then they change. So you can play it in the air. You can play it on the ground. Um, here's another one that uh, in case you want to kind of simulate a little scrimmage. Um, you got two teams going against each other. Five balls. So each team has five balls, right? And the goalkeeper always starts the balls. So this goalkeeper will start, and this goalkeeper down here will start. The team in red, they're trying to pass the ball between the blues, who are six feet apart minimum, and try and score one touch in the box. And that's the rule, right? They got to score one touch. They can't stop it and take their time. The ball's got to be played, and they have to be on side. So you can see here that ball there, and, and now they're going to play it for the runner to come in and score. The other team, though, is trying to disrupt the red team getting through, and they do that by using the ball. So if they pass the ball around and if they hit the ball that the reds are trying to use to score, that round's over, and then the goalkeepers, this goalkeeper will start another ball. Right, they can throw it. it. Doesn't matter where they throw it. They don't. You can require a certain amount of passes. The kids love it. And then the 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 defending team goes from one ball to two balls, then to three balls at a time, four balls at a time, and it really gets tougher for the team going to goal. So I've done this in several clinics. I did it in ta for Tasco, um, and. Uh, yeah, it, it, it really gets interesting, and um, it's just a fun way to, to again, kind of go to goal, try to simulate a little bit of attacking, defending, um, you know, without actual defending. So, and, so um, to yeah. Casey and Armin, if I can real quick yeah. here, Vince. Yeah. Um, so where are, let's see here. Maybe I want to get to this one. So Casey and Armin, if you're familiar, this is very much like the game Vince is showing, right? The, the kids in red are trying to hit the game ball with yeah. a with a coconut. It's like a coconut shy, but it's moving. Yeah. So that, that's pretty fundamental. This one obviously is a little bit more sophisticated. But think yeah. about it. The team that is trying to disrupt has got to disperse their players. They've got to spread it out. And you've got to work on being a receiver because off the ball, you're trying to get you're trying to get the you're you're trying to get players either side of the game ball. So if I shoot at the game ball and I miss, Vince collects and shoots back. So it's actually a really good game for getting players to move off the ball yeah. and get into receiving position. So it seems quite simple, that notion of tagging the game ball, but it really is something from our old national youth license. It's fantastic. Yep, it's just simple and fun. And then thinking this is a smaller version, right? So and what, what I've done before is I've told, I've told the team, all right, take a cone and you set up where you want to set up. So maybe they want two in the front and three in the back, for example, the red team. Um, and it's the same game, right? So they're just trying to uh, – the team in red is trying to pass and disrupt the ball. The team in white is trying to score uh, by, lots, by lots of movement. Again, throwing the offside law. Um, they got to score one touch. They got to score for cross. However, you, they got to score maybe, for example, off a ball that's laid back, right? Played back from the inline. Come up with different ways to score. Um, and that's all I got. But let me, let me, while you two are talking, let me go ahead and try and find my. Uh, yeah, I got a question for Rob. So we've obviously got mainly grassroots coaches looking, Rob, but two weeks without the ball. What are your thoughts? How, how are you starting to prepare and plan for keeping that engaging, entertaining, making it fun when essentially it's going to be conditioning based, right? How are you going to, what are your thoughts there? Uh, <laughs> going back to, to, I guess, the grassroots of what we did in PE as young relay races, obviously things that we can do that we separate from, from you know, Kind of little bit, little obstacles. Um, 
you know, like a lot of movement from each other, but just like, you know, okay, you have 30 seconds and what, which group can get through this obstacle the, the quickest and obviously it's going to be based on the distance, but it's, it's going to be a lot of creativity. And I think initially for me, my thoughts are more on longer runs only because I figure I, I look at, if I look to make my players cut dynamically right away, the injuries I think we'll have. So I'll start off with a little longer run. So their legs get a little acclimated and probably after four or five days, then start to make it a little smaller just because I feel like the ask guys to come in right away and start cutting. I don't care if it's just fitness or not. We'll be asking for a lot of, a lot of injuries. So what is a, what is a typical on a typical training activity, tra training day, progressive training session, whole part, whole, what's the length of time of a typical training session at your program? So we'll go 90 minutes. So we, we train early in the morning because of our labs for engineering. So we train, we start practice at 5.45 a.m., start at 6 p.m. with the passing. So they do their warm-up at 5.45. I come in already set up. 6, we go right into the passing, whatever we're doing. And then by 7.30, we're done. And that's including the cool down on the back end. So it's, it's really about what we stress is being efficient with the time we have. Now, with, with, with the removal of the ball now, do you think you'll shorten the training sessions initially until? Absolutely. You know, I, yeah. I think that, that even think about keeping the same distance, it'd be a huge mistake for anyone. I mean, we, the first go round may be just 10, 15 minutes, and that's it, just to get their legs going and then gradually progress. Because, again, it's about injury. It's the mental psyche, too, because, again, it's all going to be new. So there's a lot of things, not just the physical, but the mindset of these guys, and they're all going to be coming from different – areas yeah. of thought so i think start off slower make it fun then add uh time to as we go but no i don't think any running to be honest once we start will be until we can do the equipment stuff more than 25 minutes from yeah warming and up I, I think to the armenians and cases of the world because you can't finish the training session with the scrimmage because you can't get into shooting at goal perhaps in in the easiest way um then then uh Think about shortening those training sessions. Um, there are there are things you can do, and you've got some ideas from Vince, and you can make the session a bit more progressive. But don't feel compelled to go 75 minutes if that's what you normally do, or 60 minutes. Be prepared to go shorter until you've got all of your activities back. Yeah. And one thing I want to say for Vince yep. is the piggyback, and we've thought about it because I talked to some of the local clubs with the youth was. This is a great chance you have if you look at any kind of silver lining to teach spacing because they can use the ball. So if you play 77, 99, you put them in six feet apart, but understand spacing because for the first time, these kids cannot get on top of each other. So they're going to be limited and locked down. But I think at the end, you're going to see when you come in the ball, my hope would be is they'll continue the spacing because they've just been so trained. And it's also going to encourage different type of balls they have to hit. I mean, you know, if you put them six feet, now they hit with their laces a little different than they hit the side of the foot. So there's a lot of things I think we can incorporate when we look at spacing in a very, very positive way. Because we talk about having, you know, uh, space equals time, time equals better decisions. So therefore, I think we can take advantage of that and almost like shadow play, right? Line them up how you would and be able to do that. So, yeah, I like that. I like that. Um, so I was just – I. You know, here's my screen. I hope you all can see it. Yeah. Um, so I think this is what you're talking about, Ian, right? So it's it's similar to foosball. It's just a little bit more uh, gridded out. But each player has their own space. And the, white, the team in white is trying to play it to the team in blue. If they do it successfully, they get a point. If the Reds win it, then I you can see I, I like to put goals on the end um so if the reds win it let's say this red intercepts can you see my little red oval by the way on the screen no, we're not seeing the red oval we're just seeing a crosshair okay um if this player here intercepts then they can score in that goal and then these two have to defend again um if the pair in blue gets gets it through they get a point play for a little bit then they switch um, it's just a variation of, of a very popular game that, that we've seen played, except now the grids are a little bit more defined and, and again, uh, the space considerations are there. So, um, 
Well, I am. I'm going to uh, uh, turn it over to you two to end. But uh, you know, uh, if anything, uh, we got you know we got quite a few um, good comments. I hope uh, this has been beneficial. Tomorrow we're going to have Bobby Pupion on talking about college recruiting, and then tomorrow afternoon we're going to have Scott Snyder from AYSO, and we're going to talk about the same type of stuff because he's got to prepare his membership for these types of things. So. Um, we're going to talk again, just some more activities, more ideas that maybe they could they can use. But um, Rob, thank you so much uh, thank for, you joining. for having me, guys. And uh, Coach Barker, thank you. Anything that I'll let Coach Barker end it. So no, I uh, thank you for the uh, for Amin and Casey, uh, Andrew, um, the two Andrews. We've got the fifth mystery person that might be McCallum not chiming in. But please feel free to share these ideas, uh-huh. share the links. And then um, Bobby Pumpion, the college thing, very important because it's stressful for the high school kids and the college coaches. Yep. And then um, Scott Snyder is a great guy from AYSO with a very different set of challenges than the USYS community because it's a different type of model AYSO. Um, so get some of your friends to join us or be prepared to record it and share it with your friends because Scott's a bright guy. Yep. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks, Vince. Great stuff. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob.